folks, uh, last week we were talking about knowing uh, the voice of God and knowing the will of God, and want to get back into that a little bit tonight and explain it. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I love about seeking the Lord, you know, the Bible says, if you diligently seek me, you will find me. And it was probably about seven or eight years ago, uh, our chaplains are deployed all across uh, the southern Sudan. We've, we've trained over 500 men in the southern Sudan, and uh, we've had 71 of our staff killed in the war over there serving Christ. Uh, but there's a particular area called the Nuba Mountains, and before the uh, Afghan-Iraq uh, War way back uh, 20 years ago, uh, the Nuba Mountains was considered the most dangerous place in the world to be. And, uh, and we had about uh, uh, 75 chaplains that were deployed to that part of the mountains, and uh, we were constantly praying for them because they were always under attack by the Northern Islamic government. We actually, uh, there was a, a tape that was captured of the Islamic camp commander uh, speaking to the troops and he was telling them, you're to utterly wipe them out, kill them all, men, women, and children. It was really a bad place of the world. And we had literally been praying for that place and we, there was probably about a six month prayer. We were praying kind of what I would call uh, the prayer uh, about Hezekiah. Hezekiah has been uh, threatened by the king of Assyria. And, uh, and uh, you know, the Syrian king blasphemes God, and God tells him not to worry. I'm going to go ahead and deal with this. And, uh, and it says that uh, the, it says, then the angel of the Lord went out and put to death 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, they were all dead bodies. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, broke camp and withdrew. Uh, he returned to Nineveh and stayed there. And uh, if you know anything about the Syrians, they were a very ruthless people. When they would attack, uh, after the first battle, they would take the bodies of all the enemy soldiers and they would cut them up in pieces, arms, legs, heads, and they would put them on their spear tips. And when they would come back into the city for the next fight, they would hurl these pieces of the body into the uh, army that they were fighting and people were terrified of them. <clears throat> And uh, this is much the same way it was uh, in the Nuba Mountains. Uh, the Islamic army up there was particularly vicious. And, but we've been praying, Lord, in the same way that you uh, protected the children of Hezekiah in his time, that you would protect them like this. And uh, I don't remember it, maybe seven, eight years ago, uh, the Northern Army launched an attack in the Nuba Mountains on a city called Kadugli. And uh, when they attacked it, there was a small garrison of soldiers there, I think somewhere between 120 or 130 soldiers. And I think we had 12 chaplains deployed to that area. And the commander uh, of the city just told the soldiers to flee. He says, we don't have the ability to stop them. There's just way too many of them. And uh, so the soldiers packed up and left. But we had a chaplain by the name of Jobber. And, and Jobber to me is kind of like a prince of his people. He's a very noble man. Uh, before he goes into battle, he leads all the soldiers in prayer. And I think it's been one of the most touching things I've ever seen. Uh, you'll see these guys line up for battle, and they come together, and they've got their machine guns draped over the soldiers, the bandoliers of bullets, and uh, the RPGs, and they're getting ready to go into battle. And Jobber will begin to pray and thank God, and tears are literally running down his eyes, and he's a very strong man. And, uh, you know, the, the radical Islamists didn't just kill Christians, they killed nominal Muslims. If you weren't a radical Muslim, they would kill you too. So there were radical Muslims fighting with the Christians uh, of the southern Sudan. And uh, the Islamic no nominal Muslims realized that when Jabber prayed, they didn't lose very many men in battle. So they would refuse to go into battle until this Christian prayed for their army to go out and do battle. And uh, when they hit Kadugli, uh, like I said, they hit it with over 30,000 soldiers. Well, jo Jabber said to the commander, he goes, if we evacuate right now, they will kill every man, woman, and child in here, and we have to fight. And, you know, he said, well, I've already dismissed the army. And he said, well, we'll stay and fight with you. So there were 12 chaplains and, and probably with the commander and his men, another roughly 10 men. And they literally fought for two straight weeks. And uh, during that time, they evacuated the entire city. And Jobber's wife was uh, pregnant at the time. I think she was somewhere around uh, three months pregnant. And he said to her, he, he just said, you have to run. I will find you someday. He goes, I, if I don't fight, you're going to die. And so here's, he, he has to stand and watch his pregnant wife leave and go out uh, as he goes to battle. When the battle, when they finally withdrew from the city, you know, Jobber 
came to see me. And he said that, you know, after they had finally got all the people out and they got most of the people out of the city without being killed, he said that, you know, we were watching the enemy army. He said, Wes, there were so many dead. They were pushing them into graves with bulldozers. And he said, one night we went out and we inspected the bodies when they weren't watching. And he said, what we couldn't figure out, there were no wounds on the body. Uh, there were no bullet holes. There were no bombs. We don't know how they died. And I said, well, Jabra, we've been praying this prayer for the last six months. And when we read it, that the angel of the Lord went out and slew 185,000. You could just see his eyes get big. And it, because Jabra does believe and trust the Lord and knew that it was really the hand of God that did that. And uh, after, I think he said it was several months before he found his wife. He found her under a tree. <coughs> Excuse me. She was pregnant and uh, gave birth uh, shortly after that. But Jabra's still out there serving and he's an incredible man of God. Uh, I think that one of the things, guys, when you're praying, you know, uh, what I've always found in my own personal walk with the Lord, it's the still, small, quiet voice that speaks to the heart and leads you and guides you in what you're supposed to do. But I think that an essential to that is you have to be a person that's given to prayer. Uh, there was a three-year period of my life that I went to uh, Calvary Chapel San Clemente. It was not a large church. <clears throat> but they had a prayer meeting Every Tuesday morning and every Thursday morning, I think it was either 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning, I think it was 5, that we would go to there to pray. I don't remember now because it's been so long. And for three years, I did not miss one of those prayer meetings. I went to every single one of them. Uh, and we did not have a midweek Bible study, but we had home fellowships. Well, the same thing for the three years that I was there, I never missed a Wednesday night home fellowship. And at that time, it was long before God called me to the southern Sudan. I had no clue that I would ever go to Africa. And my heart's desire was to be a missionary in Russia. And I remember that in one of the prayer meetings, I was praying. And uh, as I was praying, I just sensed this, the Lord spoke to my heart and he says, I'm going to send you to Russia this year. Well, I've been praying about going to Russia for uh, 13 years that, that I'd been out in the normal work world. I've been praying previous to that uh, when I was in the Marine Corps, probably another three or four years there. And uh, I, I just had a strong sense of well, when the prayer meeting was over, there was a, another brother by the name of Jim Schultz, and we didn't even discuss Russia in the prayer meeting. And I just said, you know, Jim, I go, it's really strange. I said, when I was in this prayer meeting, I had a sense from the Lord that he was going to send me to Russia. And he goes, you know, Wes, he said, it's funny that you said that, because when we were praying, I had the same sense that God was going to send you to Russia. Now, they knew I had a heart for it. Well, I went home and I started to write a newsletter and I tried to put it together to send out maybe raise support to go and I couldn't get it to come together. And, and I was a little bit frustrated. I prayed and I said, Lord, I, I, I felt like you told me you're going to send me to, to Russia and I tried to put this together, but I can't get it together. And what the Lord spoke to my heart, he said, I told you I was going to send you to Russia. I didn't say you were going to send yourself. And so I kind of forgot about it. And uh, I don't know Guys, it was probably at least six months later, I remembered it. And when I remembered it, it troubled me because the Bible says, my sheep know my voice. And I said, Lord, I really thought that was you. And if that wasn't you, what did I hear? I mean, do I know how to understand and perceive your voice in things? And uh, the Lord, uh, uh, I, I had just a sense to just to not worry about it. Well, that Wednesday night, I went to my home fellowship. And the three years that I went there, uh, there was a sister in our church by the name of Kathy White. Now, she did not attend our home fellowship. She was at another one. She was very faithful to it, but she never attended ours. Well, that one Wednesday night, she attended ours because she was asked to come and play the guitar. And so I got to the home fellowship, and Kathy walked up to me, and she said, Wes, I want you to do me a favor. And I said, what's that, Kathy? She goes, I want you to get a passport. I said, why do you want me to get a passport? She says, because I have a trip that's fully paid for to Russia. And every time I pray, God tells me to give it to you. Well, guys, my dream had always been to go into the Russian prisons and preach the gospel. And the group that I would go with was Eastern European Outreach, and where they were going was the prisons. And, uh, you know, I think obedience is so important for the believer because uh, I look at the 38 countries we're in now, all the people that we have on the mission field around the world. Had Kathy not given that to me, I don't know that I would have ever gone to the mission field but her obedience ushered in this ministry. And so she plays a huge part in, and has a great reward in that. I think perseverance in prayer is extremely important. And uh, I want to come to uh, the book of Daniel. And guys, and uh, 
Daniel uh, chapter 10, it says, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was called Belteshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war. The understanding of the message came to him in a vision. At the time, I, Daniel, mourned for three weeks. I ate no choice food, no meat or wine, touched my lips, and I used no lotion at all until three weeks were over. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the river Tigris, I looked up, and there before me was a man dressed in linen with a belt of the finest gold around his waist. His body was like chrysolite, his face like lightning, his eyes like flames and torches, his arms and legs like gleam and burnished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. I, Daniel, was the only one who saw the vision. The men with me did not see it, but, they, but such terror overwhelmed them that they fled and hid themselves. So I was left alone, gazing at this great vision. I had no strength left. The face turned deathly pale. My face turned deathly pale, and I was helpless. Then I heard him speaking, and I listened to him. I fell to, into a deep sleep and my, uh, my face to the ground. A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you are highly esteemed. Consider carefully the words I'm about to speak to you and stand up. I have now been sent to you. And when it, he said to me, I stood up trembling, he continued, do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard and I have come in response to them. But the prince of Persia, king of them, resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I've come and explained to you what will happen to your people in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. And one of the things that we see here, guys, is that Daniel persisted in prayer. And uh, often in prayer, you know, um, I really think that one of the reasons we don't get victory is because we're not persistent. You know, God wants his people. He said, the Bible says, again, if you diligently seek me, you will find me. It is not casually. It's not occasionally. And guys, there, there's many scriptures throughout the word of God where God tells us how much he delights when people diligently seek him, that they have a real heart to understand and know him. And uh, so when Daniel prayed, it says the moment that he started praying, God dispatched the angel, but apparently this was some kind of demonic force that hindered him, and then God sends the, the angel Michael to reinforce him so that he might make the journey there. But God did hear his prayer, and I found that over the years that persistence in prayer is one of the most important things that I have discovered in my own personal walk with the Lord. Uh, a lot of times, you know, it's funny because, you know, I've heard pastors get up before and say, well, you know, uh, the Bible says, you know, Ask of me and it will be given to you. But they say, well, that means that if you ask according to God's will, and that is true. But, you know, they, you know I've heard pastors say, well, don't pray and ask the Lord to bless the lottery uh, because God's, God's going to bless this prayer. But when I was in Russia, there was a, a lady by the name of Melanie. And uh, she did not have a lot of money. She was quite uh, poor, to be honest with you. But two or three times a year, she would get people to sponsor her. She'd scrape together. Somehow she would get to Russia to go on mission trips. And I'll never forget, she would bring this huge duffel bag with her. And uh, it, I, I ended up having to lug that duffel bag around all the time for her because it was so big. But I remember that we had a brother that was there and we were staying at someone's house and he was a big guy and he literally sat on this bed and it just shattered. I mean, it, it splintered. He was so big. And, you know, I knew to I, I knew that I should have told him, don't sit on that bed, but, you know, you don't want to embarrass the guy. And so I'm sitting there with a couple of guys, and I said, I said, I don't know what we're going to do. I said, we've got to find a drill and put this bed back together. And Melanie goes, well, I got a drill in my bag. I, I go, you got a drill in your bag? I, I mean, who brings a drill to Russia, you know? So she reaches in her bag, and she pulls out a drill, and I go, well, that's great. I said, but we got to find some screws. So she goes, oh, I got those too. And she reaches in there, and she pulls out a box of screws, and she gives them to us. Well, guys... The testimony that, this is a true testimony, Melanie uh, did not have a lot of money. And there was some local lottery going on. It wasn't like the California lottery where you win millions of dollars. But she needed furniture for her house. Well, in this lottery, they were giving away a set of furniture. So she literally 
went to every person she knew, said and said, listen, guys, I, I need this furniture. I can't afford to buy furniture. I want everybody in the church to pray for me. And she got everybody praying. Well, guess what? She won the lottery and got the furniture. <laughs> a couple months passes, and she comes back and says, you know what? They got another lottery going on, and they got a washing machine and a dryer, and I can't afford to buy a washing machine and a dryer, and I need all of you guys to pray for me because I need this washing machine and dryer. Well, everybody pray for it. Guess what? She won the washing machine and the dryer. Then there was a third one, and I think it might have been a car. I don't remember, but there was a third thing that she did the same thing for, and sure enough, guys, she won it. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go out and buy a lottery ticket, but if you do and you win, you owe us 10% in your tithing. Okay, just want you to be sure of that. And, uh, you know, guys, the Bible says that God works in mysterious ways, and, and I've learned that over the years. And one of the things that I'm sharing with you is that Hearing God's voice and knowing the will of God is really tied together with obedience. If you don't have obedience in your life, you're not going to experience God's blessing. Uh, in the first year that I, we started the ministry in southern Sudan training chaplains, I got malaria. And uh, I remember that when I got malaria, I could have got on a bush plane and flown out to a western hospital. But I really clearly heard the Lord's voice tell me, stay in the village, don't leave. And I knew that the Lord wanted it because it, was, it would be a witness to the people. Now, guys, I, in my years of being in Africa, you know, I don't know exactly how many times I've had malaria. You know, I say 20, my staff says 35 to 40. I really have not kept up count with it. <clears throat> but my temperature was extremely high, and I was in and out of consciousness during this time. Uh, there were two commanders in the Army. One was one a commander by the name of Kwamenyan. Another one was uh, the commander, Mamul. They're both generals now, but they were commanders back then. And uh, my wife, Vicky, who was not my wife at the time, told me that the uh, commander Qual came to see me three times, uh, commander Mamul came to see me three times, and the chaplains came to see me five times. I only ever remember seeing each of them one time. That's how much I was out of consciousness. And I remember that one time I woke up and I looked across the room and I saw two goats in the room. And I looked at Vicky and I said, Vicky, am I hallucinating or are there actually two goats in my room? She goes, no, there's two goats in your room. I'm, this is the hospital that we have in our village there. And guys, they took my temperature. And again, I have no explanation. I, I didn't take it. I don't remember them taking it. And they did take it under the arm. They didn't put it in my mouth, but they said my temperature was 111 degrees. And they took it twice. Now, I've heard that under the arm, it can be off by about two degrees, so that can make it 109. But past 106 degrees, you're not supposed to survive. And I remember that I could literally feel my body dying. I, I don't know if it, some of you out there, maybe you've experienced being close to death. Well, I could feel myself dying. I knew that I was, I was fading. And I remember praying at that point, and I said, Lord, I know that I cannot go down much more and come back up. If you don't break my fever, I, I know that I'm not going to make this. And the Lord spoke to me in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and he talked to me about Paul's suffering. And Paul talks about the persecution that he went through in the first 11 years of his ministry. Now, guys, at the timeline that Paul the Apostle writes this, he's 11 years into his public ministry. He's got another 11 years before he's going to be martyred for his faith. And he tells us what happened in the first 11 years. And he says, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with a rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from Gentiles, in danger from Jews, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without food. I've been cold and naked. And besides all these other things I face daily, my pressure and my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? Paul tells us that in the first 11 years of his ministry that he has been beaten nine times severely for the gospel. Now, guys, the reason they would give you 40 lashes minus one is they used a whip called the cat nine tails. It had a rod with nine to 12 pieces of leather hanging down from it. Within the leather, there was pieces of shell, pieces of metal, and pieces of bone. And when you would hit someone on the back, it would literally grab the flesh and pull it right out of your body. Early historians tell us that the reason they gave 39 lashes 
is because most men would die at the 40th lash. Now, not everybody would even make it to 39, but as a general rule, 39 you would live and 40 you would die. So they'd literally beat you within an inch of your life. And they said that men who often went through this beating, even if they survived it, they would go insane because of the difficulty of the, the severity of that beating there. And uh, this was just the cat and nine tails. It doesn't talk about the time of being stoned or beaten with a rod. And uh, the Lord really spoke to me about suffering for the gospel there, and that was the reason that he had me there. Well, I remember that when Kwame Mignon came in, guys, Kwame Mignon is a massive man. I mean, he's like six foot seven or eight. He's got these, he, my hands look like baby hands compared to him. He's a big man. And he was known as the butcher of Sudan. People said that, you know, when Qual would enter into the city, he would wipe out half the inhabitants. Uh, they said he would line people up and walk down and say, shoot this one, shoot this one, this one lives, shoot this one, shoot this one. And I remember waking up and seeing Qual at the end of my bed, and I could tell that he was worried. I also remember waking up and seeing General Mamul, who was a general now, he was a commander then, and he smiled at me and he came over and he took care of held in my hand. And guys, General Mamula and I are, are extremely close now. I was the best man at his wedding, which it's a tremendous honor in the Sudan. That's normally given to bring uh, a relationship with some warring tribe or something. That's what you use marriage for. You don't use it for true friendship. My wife, Vicky, was the best man uh, in a wedding. And, and Mamul was very different than Kwame Mignon. He was like a King David. He was a great warrior. I actually brought him to America probably about 10 or 12 years ago uh, to get a bullet taken out of him. And I remember that when we brought him here, uh, the doctor called me up and said, which piece of letter are you talking about? The guy's got so much metal in him, we don't know which one it is. And, um, and so uh, finally, after I prayed that prayer and the Lord gave me that scripture, my fever broke. And I went back to my safari tent. We lived in tents for the first four years that we were in the South Sudan. And uh, I remember that Kwal Mignon came to see me. And when he walked into my safari tent, I was laying down, he said, you know what else, when I saw you, I really thought that you were going to die. And I said, General, I said, if I die, I will go home to be with the Lord. But if you die, you will perish for all of eternity. He goes, I don't understand you. He goes, this isn't even your country, yet you're willing to die for it. And uh, we talked and he left. Well, guys, shortly after that, and, and General Mamul also came to see me, and General Mamul had a tremendous interest in the gospel. Uh, he was not a believer when we met him, but uh, we brought one of those little cassette players over there that you would wind up, and it would play cassette tapes, and we gave him Pastor Chuck Smith's tapes. Well, he was listening to them all the time. We brought over a little uh, television with a VCR, and we brought uh, the movie Countdown to Eternity, and the general watched that 40 times. And... Uh, the night of our first graduation, we knew that the enemy knew we were graduating a class and we were going to get bombed. And so we really prayed that the Lord would protect us that day from being bombed because we got bombed about 12, 13 times during the years that we were there and we lost people. People would be killed in those bombings. And that day, we had heavy cloud cover. The, the entire day, it looked like it was just going to pour and drench us. And we could hear the Antonov bombers going above us but they couldn't see us, so they never dropped the bombs. And at the end of the celebration that day, um, because it was a big celebration for the city to have these chaplains graduate, you know, Commander Mamul came to me and he said, I'm going to go back to my compound. I said, uh, Commander, can I give you a ride? And he said, sure. So he got in my vehicle, and about 10 or 11 of his soldiers got in, and I drove him back to his compound. When we got there, he got out of the vehicle, and at first, I was just going to leave him. I was going to drive away. But the Lord spoke to me, and he said, Wes, it's time. And I go, and I knew what the Lord was telling me, and I said, um, Commander, I need to talk to you about the most important decision you're ever going to make in your life. And I said, do you want to be forgiven of your sin? He goes, yes. I go, do you want to know if you die tonight, you'll go to heaven? He goes, yes. I go, Commander, are you ready to surrender your life to Jesus Christ? And he goes, yes. And about, in front of about, I think it was 40 of his officers, maybe 70 of his officers and soldiers. I think it was 70. He bowed his head and he became a child of the king. And guys, I've, in all the years, I've led many people to Christ, but I've never had, after he prayed, he looked at me and he goes, Wes, 
I fully understand what I have done. He goes, I have received, received the full born again Christian experience. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I will not turn back, and I want you to baptize me. And uh, guys, I was excited. I couldn't believe it. This great general or commander had given his life to Christ. So I got back in my vehicle, and I raced back to my compound to tell the staff, guys, you're not going to believe it. Commander Mamul just gave his life to Jesus Christ. Well, when I get there, Commander Kualmanyan's waiting for me. And we sit down, and we start talking, and about 30 minutes later, I'm saying the same thing. I go, Commander, do you want to know if you die tonight, you'll be forgiven of your sins? He goes, yes. Do you want to know if you die tonight, you'll go to heaven? Yes. Are you ready to give your life to Jesus Christ? Yes. And he took my hands, and he said the sinner's prayer. And guys, uh, the people in the Sudan talk about this a lot. They said, we knew this man. He was a butcher. He was a murderer. But now he's a completely different man. And guys, one of the things that, that if we, we can pray, but if we don't practice obedience. Now, I think about the fact that when I got sick, had I disobeyed the Lord and said, I don't want to be uncomfortable, and got on that airplane and flown out, would have these two men ever come to know Christ as their personal Savior? I don't know. I doubt it. But the Lord used it as a testimony for them. And one of the things as believers is a lot of time God uses suffering in our life to get other people's attention. It's something that we need to be very aware of. Um, you know, I hear people tell me that the Lord told them things. And guys, a lot of things that people tell me that God told them, I know that the Lord has not spoken to them. It's spoken through their flesh. One of my closest friend, Luke, Luke, I shared with you last week, 14 years, Marine Corps, Special Forces, speaks about seven, eight languages, and is tested at genius level. Well, he's literally had 20 women come to him and say, the Lord has told me that I am supposed to be your wife, you know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Lucas told them all, the Lord hasn't told me that, you know. <laughs> He's still not married, and truthfully, I, I don't think he ever is going to be married. I think he's much like Paul the Apostle. He's so committed to the gospel and to reaching people, I don't think that he will ever quite settle down. I've had two or three people that have told me that God has told them that they were going to be raptured, that they would not see death, that they would be raptured. The two or three people that have told me that are all home with the Lord right now and not here on earth, you know. So apparently the Lord did not tell them that. And I think that one of the things is that when we're praying and we're seeking the Lord, we have to seek God according to his will and what the word says, you know. Uh, I think that God, the, th the, the situation with Melanie was very unusual. I've never heard of anything like it again. But it was a unique situation, and I believe that God did honor her faith. Uh, I remember being up, the Bible talks about word of wisdom or word of knowledge. And guys, there are they're, they're two different things. Um, 1 Corinthians 12.8 is where we get both of those word of wisdom and word of knowledges. And uh, a word of wisdom is a form of revelation like prophecy, God giving divine knowledge in certain situations. And it's, it's when God speaks to people's heart on things that they don't know or shouldn't know. Uh, when we first started the mission field, uh, we were working very closely with Calvary Chapel Saving Grace, still a great group of people. But there was a guy down there that went to the mission field, and I remember him telling us that he said, you know, one day I was praying, and I was praying about what God wanted me to do with my life, and the Lord told me to go to Belize. Now, he didn't know what Belize was. He didn't know if it was a city, a territory, a country. He had no clue in his life. So he looks it up, and he finds out that Belize is actually a country. And he said, you know, Wes, he goes, after the Lord spoke that to me, he said, over the next month, I had about a dozen people come up to me. I told them nothing about what I was thinking. And they said to me, have you ever thought about praying and going to being a missionary in Belize? And I believe this is sometimes how God reveals to us, you know, uh, there's a word of wisdom that is supernaturally spoken through other people. Uh, we used to go up when I was in the Marine Corps, and right after I got out, we'd go up to Los Angeles to the Skid Row area, and we'd go up there and we'd feed the people that were homeless, and we would share the gospel. And we had a lady by the name of Trish, and 
Trish was always very gifted in hearing from the Lord. I, you know, you kind of envy that she just had that kind of a relationship with the Lord. And uh, I remember we were up there and we were handing out tracts and uh, she hands a tract to this guy and tells him, Jesus loves you. And he, and he hands her back another tract and it's about communism. And she's trying to convert him to Christ and she, he's trying to convert her to communism. And Trish looks at him and she said, the only reason that you believe in this is because your entire family was killed in El Salvador and you're bitter and you become a communist because you want to get even. And the guy just broke down and started crying because we didn't know him. He didn't know us. It was just a supernatural revelation that the Lord had given to Trish. I know that when I was in the business world, guys, and at a pretty young age, I was successful. Uh, when I was about 27 years old, I was probably making the equivalent of about two hundred fifty dollars to $300,000 a year in today's money. And I was in sales, and all the guys I were with were young guys in their mid-20s to early 30s, and we were making a tremendous amount of money. And all the guys that were with me drove Porsche, Mercedes. We even had one 20-year-old guy named Andre. He bought himself a, a, a brand-new Rolls Royce. I mean, we were making a lot of money. So I started thinking, well, maybe I should buy a nice car too. This is the world that I live in. So I'm thinking about buying a twin turbo Maserati. I'm a young Christian. Well, I'm not a young Christian, but I'm a Christian. And, and I remember that uh, I really felt I wanted to ask Trish if, if, if I was making a mistake, but I didn't want to tell her, you know. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't want to tell her what I was thinking. I didn't want to know how carnal I was. And... Uh, so she calls me on the phone, and we start talking, and she goes, Wes, is there something you want me to pray about? And I said, I don't know, Trish. There's always a lot of things going on with me. She goes, but is there something specific or that you need an answer from the Lord? And I said, well, yeah, there, there probably is. And she goes, do you want me to pray for you? And I said, yes, please pray for me. And so she starts praying, and then she looks at me, and she goes, I don't know what you're thinking about, but the Lord has told me to tell you no and again, I say, no. <laughs> and so I said, what about the DeLorean, you know? Uh, you know, guys, uh, if you're ever praying about going out and buying an exotic car, I don't suggest you pray about it if you actually want to get it, because I don't think you'll get what you want there. Because word of knowledge is, is different. Word of knowledge is, um, is supposed to come from biblical knowledge we have, and God using that knowledge in a certain circumstance to reveal things to us. You know, uh, we went out and we saw, I went out and saw Jesus Revolution this week. And if you haven't seen it, I really recommend that you go and see it. I thought it was a great movie. You know, everybody who's seen it knows it's not completely accurate. But beyond that, the one great thing that comes through is the love that the people had for each other. And uh, I know myself, uh, when I started going to Calvary Chapel back then in the early days of the ministry, because I got saved May 11, 1976 at the Marine base at Camp Pendleton, California. And they took me to Calvary Chapel. And I remember that they, I, the guy said to me one night, do you want to go to Calvary Chapel? I said, what's Calvary Chapel? Or they would go, do you want to go to Calvary? I said, what's Calvary? They go, it's a church. I said, sure. And I remember going into the auditorium and there's just thousands of hippie that have all bathed which was a big miracle for me in the first place to see hippies that had bathed. But one of the things that struck me about it, and I couldn't wrap my head around it, you would see these young, beautiful hippie girls, and they would go up and they would kiss some guy on the cheek that you think, why in the world would a girl like that kiss a guy like that? I, I couldn't understand it, but it was pure. It was holy love. And that's what I remember about that back then. But, you know, in the movie, Lonnie Frisbee, guys, gives a prophecy to Greg Laurie that he will have a church of thousands. And whether that's a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom, I don't know. But I think that Lonnie had seen some of the gifting in Greg's life. It was becoming very evident at a very early age. But there are different ways that we can learn and discern the will of God in this area. And guys, it says that, um, it says with word of wisdom, it says wisdom is the ability to use knowledge for the correct purpose. All Christians are to ask God for wisdom on how to live. James wrote the following words. 
If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. So this is what a word of wisdom is supposed to be. Now, on the word of knowledge, let me see what how this is. It says, again, the supernatural revelation combined with knowledge to deal with the problems. And I do believe that God gives people supernatural knowledge to deal with problems. I've seen it many times over the years. I think one of the things that I want to encourage you about in your faith is don't become discouraged in your faith because things don't work out the way that you want. One of the things that we need to realize is that God has a higher wisdom than all of us. You know, guys, something happened to me a couple months ago. There was a young man that my wife and I had discipled in Africa. His name was Duncan. Duncan, when he was a young child, his father died very young. Uh, his mother was very traumatized. They were in a very badly war-torn area. And uh, Duncan told me that when he was five years old, that the rebels attacked the village he was in. And his entire family just scattered. They ran in all kinds of directions. And he's a five-year-old boy, and he's running out into the wilderness. And in Africa, they have what's called this spear grass. And if you get it in your feet, you never really get it out. I mean, the pain does somewhat subside, but you'll always have this sensation in your foot the rest of your life. And he's running through spear grass. You know, he got to a, an area and ran into a family and told them what was happening, and they told him to sit down. And Duncan was too afraid. They said, let, let us get you some food. And he ran off. At five years old, he's in the bush for three days by himself. Uh, he finally finds his way back to the city center and he runs into his brother and he said, you know, I ran into my older brother that was probably seven. He said, we just threw our arms around him. We just cried. And fortunately, all of his family survived. But his mother, because of the hardship of life, started to drink alcohol. And uh, at seven years old, he walked in and she was gone. Now, he's already lost his father. He's run from rebels. Well, Duncan was adopted by uh, a family that runs our farm in Africa. We have a school for children that holds about 700 children. It's a castle. It's a very safe and secure area. And they kind of adopted Duncan, took him under their wing. Richard and Susan did. And my wife, Vicki, pointed out Duncan to me a number of years ago, and we could tell there was something really different about this kid. He was just special. And I remember that every time we would have a pastor's conference or a missions conference or we were teaching the people, Duncan would be in the front row and he was literally on the edge of his chair. And he would come up to me afterwards and he'd go, Pastor Wes, I just feel like I learned so much from you. And I saw his life just so vibrant for the Lord. Well, we, we sent him to college and he graduated number one in all of Uganda, the entire country. And while he was in college, there were many young girls that pursued him. He's a good-looking kid. He's handsome. Duncan kept his testimony pure. He would witness Christ to them, and they realized they were not going to get what they wanted with him. That was just the kind of kid he was. And I remember that when he graduated, um, I bought him a motorcycle for transportation. It was his graduation gift. And, and, and Duncan was really like a son to me. I mean, I, I, I really loved him. And... And when the Calvary teams would go over a couple years ago, Don McClure and, and about 15 pastors came over, and we'll have it again this year. And everybody loved Duncan, and people would comment about him. I remember there was a young girl that had come over. She was about 23, and she said, you know, the one thing that I notice, she goes, I know that I'm an attractive girl, and there's several pretty girls here, but I watch Duncan, and he's ministering to all the older ladies. He doesn't even pay attention to us. He's out there. He's taking care of the ladies that are in their late 60s and 70s, he's ministering to them. And she goes, this is the kind of guy that I want to marry. I don't want to marry men like men in America. I want to marry a guy like this. And uh, I remember when I was over there a few months ago, I, we were, I was helping Duncan to build a house. And, you know, we built our own houses. We make our own blocks. And Duncan was doing a great job. And he's a very smart kid. He went out and he leased pieces of property and he was growing crops and uh, making a, a decent living. And we were planning to open a passion fruit farm in Africa because it's a very high dollar crop. If you have a hundred acres of passion fruit, you can make about two to three million dollars a year. 
and we were planning on growing 300 acres because we want the ministry to be self-sufficient. And my, I was going to raise Duncan up to oversee this entire operation. And I remember sitting there thinking to myself, you know, Lord, he's the son that I have always wanted. He is so special to me. Every time I would come and see that kid, he would just throw his arms around me and he would hug me. And got a call about two months ago. Duncan was on a bus headed to Kampala, the capital. A tractor trailer broke down and they put no lights or anything and these bus drivers drive at ridiculous speeds. They go like 75 miles an hour. Well, the tractor trailer was broken down and they hit that thing at 70 miles an hour. And everybody on Duncan's side of the bus was killed, including Duncan. It is tremendously hard for me to understand that. I can't wrap my head around it. But you know, the Bible says, the righteous are taken away and no one understands. It's to save them from evil days. And one of the things that we need to realize is that God sees the future. So if the Lord says no to something, it's for your best. Many young women, God has told them not to marry someone, and many young men. But he was the big man on campus, and they married him. And later down the road, they're miserable. And again, guys, the answer is not to get a divorce. The answer is to seek your God. But when God says no, it's not because he's trying to withhold something from you. It's because he's trying to protect you. Luke and I, and I'm going to close here in a second. My time is up. Luke and I have talked about a lot of what we see going on around the world. And we have an orphanage in Central America, and it's for handicapped children. But, guys, all of these children that we have in the orphanage have been sold into prostitution. I have a three-year-old that we need reconstructive surgery because she was made a prostitute at three years of age and up to 10 men a day were violating this young girl. I have a nine-year-old that told us that when she was about six or seven, her father started bringing in five to six men every night to watch her shower and then each of the men would take their turn with her. She is HIV positive and needs reconstructive surgery on both the front and the back. There are things that I will never fully understand. But the thing that you have to do is trust the Lord when you don't understand. The beginning of wisdom is to trust the Lord. God knows things we don't know. The great thing that I can say is these children are safe. I am, I've got a meeting with the president of that country in May. And they have a law in that country that children can't be adopted if they've been molested, and we're going to try to get that law changed. Plus, the criminal gangs that are selling them, we're going to try to intervene and do something about it. And I can look at it and say, why God? But we have to realize that we live in a fallen world. There are things that you just have to leave in the hands of God. You're not ever going to fully understand it. I will miss Duncan forever. But I know he's with the Lord. And I know that God brought him into our lives to love him, to disciple him, and to make a difference. And in the same way in your own life, I would encourage you to pray and ask the Lord to give you wisdom. In 1 Chronicles 16 and 11, it says, Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his face continually. I look at all the lives that have been saved around the world through this ministry. You know, one of the things that has happened, guys, and and I will close with this, In Afghanistan, the Taliban does unbelievably cruel things to people and women in particular. But when we go in there and we rescue these people and they ask us why we came for them, 
we tell them Jesus. They can't understand that because in their religion, God is cruel and you make a mistake and he will murder you. He will torture you. But what's happened because the Lord has led us into that and because of the system that they're under, these people are coming to know Christ in great numbers. Now, if they were not under that persecution, they probably would have never come to Christ. And it's sometimes hard to understand and justify, but because of the great suffering they're going through, it's opened their heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And while they might have suffered, they're coming to know him as their personal Lord and Savior. The beginning of wisdom is fear of the Lord. And guys, when the Bible talks about fear of the Lord, <clears throat> it is a reverent fear. But it's also an awe-inspiring fear of when you know that you don't do what's right, there are consequences. <clears throat> so I want to encourage you as you seek the Lord and you seek his will for your life, whatever God says to you, just do it. Learn just to be obedient. People ask us how our ministry grow so fast. And I, all I tell them is obedience. We just did what the Lord told us. God bless you.